right. So House of the Dragon season two is about to wrap up. The uh, season finale is in two days, but um, I will be out of town. So you'll get my reaction to that at a separate location at the end of this video. Um, I have not been making uh, videos about each episode like I had intended to do. Mostly because I want to keep things positive on this channel. I will tell you when I dislike something. But I don't need week by week update episode by episode of why I'm disliking things. So um, I did not hate this season so far. I have many issues with it. And I'm sitting at a firm average low average of enjoyment. It's just everything I loved about this season was tainted by something I hated. There was no one solid episode where really I loved everything about it. There was always something that I'm just like, God, I wish that didn't happen. Um, so like 5 out of 10 so far, maybe a 4.5 out of 10. I'll let you know how the uh, final episode changes that ranking. Um, but I understand completely that we have two different mediums. I adore the book. Fire and Blood is quite possibly my favorite of the Song of Ice and Fire franchise series. I am obsessed with Fire and Blood. Love it so much. So I understand things need to be changed in the adaptation. It's just that the choices they made many times, in my opinion, was terrible for the narrative of the show they were creating. So you can make changes, but when your changes are annoying in their own right, I'm going to have issues with it. Uh, then you have people online talking about how the book is an unreliable narrator. When entire characters are removed, when you change the birth dates, when you change the ages, motivation, okay, maybe motivations can be different, but when characters are missing, that is not, hey, we fever dreamed this character's existence and wrote it into a history textbook. Okay, no, no, characters are gone. The show is not what really happened. That's what bugs me the most about conversations online is going to be people saying, well, the book's unreliable narrator and the show is what actually happened in this fictional world. And I'm just like, no, no, they're both separate universes and I'll never get answers to one of the universes. The universe I actually care about when Maylor exists, I will never get answers to things that I really wanted to know in this universe. Instead, I'm witnessing a universe of characters I care far less about with events that do not hit anywhere close to the same. That's me being a little bit mean, but I'm sorry. Um, so what do I mean? There's a couple actually changes where I'm, there's like one where I'm neutral with in the show. In the show's own right, I don't mind it. I just liked it better in the book, but I don't hate it in the show's narrative. So one of my main issues with the show is going to be how it was portrayed and marketed. And that's going to be a big of choose your side. The marketing was everywhere. Black and green, choose your side. Except the black team was deified to high heavens, could do no wrong. Saint Rhaenyra could, Realm's Delight, which she is, love her also. I'm team black. I love Rhaenyra with all my heart and soul. I, I quite literally, I have her ring or crown as a ring. I I love Rhaenyra, I do. But the deification of her character, the what she did to avoid war, to take all the blame that could have possibly be put on her, that could possibly make her a morally gray character, no. She is completely flawless, nothing is her fault. Um, and then uh, Team Green, where you have every mistake that could be made no redeeming qualities. So when your marketing is choose a side, you think both will have good and bad qualities when it's clearly not. It's very obvious which side the narrative wants you to take. Okay, well, that's just marketing. Gotta experience the story itself. They stripped all the agency away from their two title characters, and that was the problem. I like season one. I liked that Allison and Rhaenyra were childhood friends. That's a change I welcomed in the uh, from the books. It was fantastic. I loved the change in their dynamic. I loved... Um, like the child bride of Allison and the resentment she felt to Rhaenyra as Rhaenyra 
to Allison's perspective, was allowed to do whatever she wanted and the world had to bend to her. I adored that change. But now I see the consequences of that in season two, where now you, you've put this much focus on these two title characters. And they are the title characters in the books and the original, what was it, Two Queens, original title of it, whatever. Um... But now you strip all the agency away from Allison. It is like she she feels lost this season as everyone's making choices around her. And that's kind of the point in this world. Uh, women with no agency and decisions are being made for them. But it really just feels like she's there because she was such an important part of season one. And now they don't know what to do with her. So they have her sleep with Christian Cole for some reason as taking the um, moon tea. And I'm just like, okay, hypocrites. Great way to make me hate these characters more. But it's just making them hateable. I don't feel any depth to their characters. But I should because, again, now she's acting as how she's accusing Rhaenyra for acting. But it's just not feeling like she is a driving force in her own narrative. And I guess that's the point, but it's not entertaining. Maybe it is a good story for somebody else, but I'm not enjoying watching their side of the narrative right now. Especially when the last episode I've seen is her just screwing off to the woods as she abandons her children, her people, and just takes one of the nights to go off camping in the woods so she can float in a lake for a pretty imagery of uh, a bird floating ahead of her. So you have that symbolism. As Renice had said, you have built a, a beautiful window in your cage to look out through. Um, and she wants to be free floating in the water, drifting off with the freedom of the bird ahead of her. That is what she wants, but it's not what she has. So beautiful imagery, yet the story's narrative was so convoluted to get there and forced to put her in that position that it feels forced and unnecessary. I don't like it when I like imagery and symbolism, but not when the narrative has to shoehorn it in. I don't know if anything I said made any sense whatsoever, but boils down to stripping Allison's agency away from her feels like a disservice to her character in the books. She was very much a driving force. She's the one who commands that the gates be closed when citizens are trying to flee. She is the one actively pursuing this war. Whereas in this version, Allison would stop it if she could. She realized she made a mistake. And I, okay, the Scooby-Doo breaking into the castle of Rhaenyra to talk to Allison is probably the thing I hate most. Like, how I don't understand how much stupid of a decision you can make. But for Allison to come to realize that uh, she was wrong about Viserys' final words and was actually talking about Aegon the Conqueror being the prince that was promised, not her own son, despite the fact that we having another Aegon on Rhaenyra's side. I think I would have liked it more if she was just still in the dark believing with her whole heart that this is what her husband wanted and she's doing what is right for the realm and just move forward with that motivation as the driving force instead of being in this mental conflict with her own decisions and accepting that there's nothing that she can do to change it. I've already mentioned that uh, Rhaenyra was deified, like all bad decisions could that she made were taken away from her. Um, I think the straw that broke camel's back for me is the push it over the edge was a hundred percent when Rhaenys said to her was uh, went to fight um Rook's Rest and Rhaenyra had said I will go myself I will take my dragon I will go defend our people I will fight and everyone's like no 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 queen you cannot if anything happens to you um, the war is lost. You're the figurehead. We need you alive, which is true. Um, but then Renice says, you have to send me. I will go. It's not like Rhaenyra ordered Renice to uh, go off and fight. So to take even that molecule of blame away from her. It's like, oh, you ordered her off to her death. No, no one can say that because she 100% volunteered. And that little change just doesn't work for me. Um, other things like uh, in the book, uh, it being implied that Rhaenyra was an equal part of the blood and cheese. I like the change where she had no idea and um, it was all Damon and everyone blames her for it. So that's like a, an example of something that she did that was very much wrong in the book 
was actually her trying to do the right thing wasn't her fault in the series. So that's a change I enjoy. Somehow the TV series made Aegon my favorite character this season. How is that possible? The one who assaulted the maid the last season? Apparently he's the only character in this I'm liking in terms of character arc and development. Because to see him, who has been rejected by his father all last season, the, his father had his entire life to name him his heir, never once did, held steadfast to that his sister would be his heir, accepted that, had his mother and uncle whispering in his ear, no, you will be king, Rhaenyra will kill you, uh, you are a threat to her claim, you must be king. And then for him to feel that admiration of the people cheering him on for the first time in his life, getting that recognition, getting that approval that he craves, um, to sit on the Iron Throne and genuinely, genuinely listen to the people. He's a he doesn't know what he's doing, but he's trying. He's listening. He's in this moment, what can I do to make things better, to be a good king, to have their love and respect? He wants their respect. He does not want to be laughed at. Um but not thinking long term. Like I genuinely feel with the right people around him, he could have been a good king. Um, as Team Rhaenyra, 100%, rightful queen, long live her. Um, but um, then to be overlooked at the council, he doesn't speak High Valyrian the way his younger brother does. He's inadequate in every sense. Uh, being given a crown does not give him wisdom and he's no one's listening to his ideas because he has not been trained for this. They've been whispering in his ear, you should be king, but they have not been teaching him military strategies, the histories. He does not understand the education that you need to be a ruler. And he doesn't know he has to listen to those around him. So his mother's like, why don't you just shut up, do nothing, and listen to the counsel of those who are wiser around you. But instead, he wants that uh, recognition. He wants that glory. He wants to be loved and admired. So he flies off recklessly drunk. Um, didn't even teach. He didn't know, He doesn't know enough high valor. And he's speaking English to his dragon. I love that part. Um, and to go out into battle and to see him absolutely devastated and crushed when his own brother attacks him? Yes, Aegon. How, how was Aegon my favorite character this season? Uh, this leads to something that I don't know if I dislike. I don't think, this is one for the show, it works. But my personal preference for how the book handled it, like there's no show that in the books uh, Aegon and Aemon had any hostility for each other. But that being said, the book was written with a very much uh, green tinted lens. Um, so I think I just prefer when family love each other and there's love among them and friendship. It's one, okay, I'm softy at heart, I guess. So for Aemon to attack Aegon, it works. It does work. But oh, I just wish that he was, I am loyal to my brother. I wish, I wish that was the case. But it does work out really well in a contrasting parallel with Viserys not trusting Damon, thinking he was greedy, power hungry, and couldn't trust him and his decisions and actions. But really, Damon just wanted to be with his brother, be close to him, to protect him. The honor of his family was everything. Uh, Contrast that with Aegon thinking Aemon was a loyal dog and would do whatever he said, only for Aegon to burn his brother and betray him and take the power for himself. Okay, yeah, it works. I don't even know where to start with Harrenhal because it just went on too long. I, I'm not, listen, I said season one needed to slow the pacing down. We need like two or three more episodes. So I enjoy the slower strategical pacing and thought and war councils of season two. Um, but Damon and Harrenhal, this would have worked if we were having like a 12 to 22 uh, episode season like we did back in the day, but we don't. We have eight episodes. Damon has spent too long at Harrenhal. It feels like we've wasted time, and if we had devoted some of this time that we spent in Harrenhal, we could have introduced other characters. But that being said, I don't want to rush too fast through Harrenhal because it has some of my favorite moments in the series. Um, Damon specifically, in front of the Weirwood tree, getting that flashback of uh, young Rhaenyra sewing uh, Jaehaerys's uh, throat together, his head back on his body, to recognize the harm that he's done. 
Um, the consequences of his actions as now his wife slash niece does not trust him as he has damaged her uh, right to the throne, her name, her reputation. Um, that was such an amazing scene. And it seems like it was really the turning point when he is fully on her side as before it was his father's throne. It, he is the king, not king consort. He thinks so highly of himself that it's hard to see him view Rhaenyra as a queen in her own right, even though he's the one who crowned her. Um, he had talked about uh, people should serve their liege lord no matter the stake of them, no matter what position they find themselves in. And mostly he's thinking of his brother, but he could also be thinking of Rhaenyra. She is his queen. He should respect that. And then for Alison, Alice no, Rivers, at least whatever her name is, Rivers, uh, to go to him and say, you're going to die here. For him to know that he was going to die at this location, at the God's Eye, and he chooses later to return here anyway for the final fight for his queen, that this feels like the turning point for his character where he had this like 10% selfishness, uh, his own rights, his own claim, his own resentment for losing his place as the heir, um, to fully be committed to Rhaenyra. That, that was the moment for me that really felt like he was in this for his queen now, for his wife, for his queen, for Rhaenyra. Uh, and then you had moments where he's talking to, uh, Viserys and, um, saying I, you should have been, he should have been by his side after his wife had died, Elma, when he was grieving, he should have held his, his brother and been there for him, but instead he had chose to leave to face the consequences of those actions. For young Rhaenyra in her older outfit, wearing the crown, talking to him in High Valyrian, uh, saying you abandoned me, and for him to cut off her head, the res getting rid of all that resentment, the past mistakes he's made, those moments were glorious. But then you also have moments where he's half high, walking around, he's completely high, walking around the castle and taking strange mixtures with blood magic from this lady he has no reason to trust when he shouldn't, he wasn't even eating food from the other people there. And it just feels so dragged on, but at the same time we seen his first wife and she's asked about you taking care of our girls and he was not. So there's some moments that I really, really love, but we just spent so much time there in his weird out of it kind of mindset that it just went on too long in Heron Hall. Again, if we had many more episodes that this was just slower pacing, would have loved it. But we have eight episodes and you're wasting half, well not half, but you're wasting one of them with a scene of him having sex with his mother. Because why not? I'm going to try really, really, really hard not to rant too much about this. Mail or the Missing. Maylor, his removal from this series is something I will never let go of, never forgive. We have ruined blood and cheese so much that I don't even know what I, I'm, I will never have the words. Because this decision to remove him makes absolute zero sense to me. So... Blood and cheese has no heartache to it whatsoever. You have the brutal murderer of a child, uh, which is never going to be good, but this was not what made that scene emotional. It was the fact that they were forcing a mother to choose between her two sons, and for her to choose her youngest, Maelor, for them to kill then her oldest, the heir to the throne, Jaehaerys, and her have to live with the fact that she cho chose her other son for death, that absolutely destroyed Helena. She could not look at her son afterwards. Instead, it was not choose which son, it was which one is the son. This is your, one of these is your daughter, one of these is your son. You tell me which one your son is and then I'll kill that one. It removed that choice, that not fault, it was never her fault, but the absolute anguish and terrible situation from her. That is a complete change that I will never understand. And people say, well, they didn't set up Maelor. They didn't set up his brother Darren either, but he gets just name dropped and that's good enough. We couldn't have just said, that was probably him in the background. We don't know. I don't understand removing him. Am I also pissed because now we can't have Bitterbridge? Because I need to know the chaos, what triggered 
uh, the event of Maelor's death at Bitterbridge and then how that affects Daron later on and his reaction afterwards and the mercy he shows the people who killed his brother, I don't understand why you'd remove him. Then you have removing Nettles. Because this is one where in the show, I don't mind so much. It works for the show's narrative. I won't be angry at the change the show made. It's just upsetting that Nettles, being the only dra supposed dragon seed that has no Valerian features, has no confirmed or implied connection to a Targaryen heritage, that drives me crazy because I wanted answers. How was she able to bond with Sheepstealer? Now, personally, I think she is uh, Damon's daughter. That is what I believe from the books. However, that is in no way confirmed, and it leaves open the possibility that either she's from a different Valarian dragon lord bloodline, that it's not just the Tar Tar Targaryens who escaped Old Valyria and the Doom, or it could very well be that the dragon lords of old were a bunch of liars and anyone could bond with a dragon. Anyone could ride a dragon. They were just the ones with the dragons, and no one else had the opportunity to try, and they were not gods among men. Any one could bond with a dragon, but they just didn't give anyone the chance. There's also a theory that she's actually Leaf in disguise, and I don't hate that. I'm like, kind of, I want answers to who Nettles is and where she went, because her and Sheepsteel are just leave the book, and I'm like, where'd you go? Can, little answer? Where, where are we? Where, where'd she go? Where, did she die? Did she die? When did she die? When did Sheepstealer die? Are they alive? Are they in the north, sleeping in uh, the snow somewhere? But instead, it looks like Reyna is getting uh, her dragon and storyline, which means we have to lose the um, jealousy that Rhaenyra feels towards Nettles for possibly bewitching, seducing Daemon, and that being another thing that's her driving her into madness. Because who knows, we might not even get Rhaenyra's paranoia and as she's betrayed over and over again and feels this betrayal, even though there's no betrayal there. Um, but we probably will get some of it, but just not this one. Um, I don't I don't like that, because again, right now we're deifying Rhaenyra. But that being said, I think we're just going with, if we make her this saintly kind of thing, it just gives her further to fall. I assume that's the direction they're going. How I feel about uh, Reyna getting Sheep Stealer, most likely in the finale, or at least soon. I only dislike it because I want it Nettles. For the show, it gives her more screen time, it gives her a good story. She has been sent away because she didn't have a dragon, um, which was her biggest fear as a child, being tossed out of Essos or Pentos, wherever she was to with her family, and saying, will they even let me stay if I don't have a dragon? Both you, mother and father, and my sister all have dragons. I don't. And now she has been forced away because she doesn't have a dragon. Only for her, like her mother, to claim this giant dragon. So it works well for the series. So the removal of Nettles hurts me because I want answers to who her Targaryen link is, if there's any. But for the show, I will accept that uh, it is good for Reyna's character. Everything with the Blackwoods and the Brackens. Flawless, zero notes, absolutely glorious, would take an entire series and seasons on why they hate each other and the animosity that they feel between them. Uh, yeah, no. And it goes so well with the twin uh, Kingsguard's arc, um, Eric with an E and Eric with an A. Uh, one siding for Aegon and one with Rhaenyra. These two families who love each other and were tore apart and were forced to fight each other to the death for the causes that they loved. And then Eric being unable to live with himself so he has to commit suicide because he can't bear the thought that he killed his own brother that was the most excellent fight in the entire series as one claims you separated us you tore us apart and it's like no I'm siding with my true queen oh I'm siding with the king it's it's just so good and the again the Blackwoods and the Brackens they have had times where through marriage they have come together and come apart and then the hatred between them keeps festering up but they no longer understand why they hate each other, why 
the, the animosity. So it goes back to what started this war. Um, and Rhaenyra saying, that's easy. It's when my brother Aegon um, usurped the thrones. Like, was it? Was it when the child was killed? When was, or was it when Aegon, or yeah, Aegon lost his eye? It'll be lost to history. It's all going to be muddled and everyone's just going to be fighting for the sake of fighting and bloodshed and war and no one will care about the cause or if this was just. They are just going to be lost in the madness. Beautiful, excellent, no complaints. And as much as I hate Kristen Cole, to no ends, this hypocrite who just got spurned and now hates Rhaenyra and oh my god, as much as I hate him, to see him running through a field with a dragon above them, burning the men around him, and he realizes how insignificant his armies are to dragon fire, and being devastated by that realization, that is a good scene. I also adored when, uh, was it Stefan Draken or something like that, tried to claim sea smoke, and at first is looking like he's doing well, an uh, interpretation of me watching this scene, uh, sea smoke, darling, sweet boy, no, 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 don't burn, no, don't, please, please, no, please don't, no, listen to me, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out, don't, and then burn. I, the entire episode was just me talking to my computer, begging sea smoke, I know you're going to burn him to death, but please don't, hear me out, I beg of you. Um... It almost looked like he had done it, but it was when he said, I have done it. He thought he had mastered this dragon. That's when Sea Smoke turned on him. And it was almost like this arrogance is what uh, rejected Sea Smoke. So for Sea Smoke to fly around, chase down Alan, and to kind of kidnap him to be his new rider, it's like, I'm on a beach with the queen. I will kneel and bow to you. I've been kidnapped by this dragon, but now that I'm here, can you teach me to be a dragon rider? Um, adore it, adore it, adore it. What I don't like is that the only way this works is to assume that Lainor has died off screen because I refuse, I refuse to accept the fact that the dragon, the bond between dragon and rider is so weak and fickle that it is just broken with time and distance because that does not work out well for events later in the series if a dragon can only be claimed by one rider, no one else can ride them. And then for you to give the excuse that the bond has been broken just with time and distance from Lenore. Refuse to believe it, because that's the stupidest decision I've ever heard in my life. Probably even worse than removing Maylor. Whoever suggested that should be fired. Um, but we're, I'm assuming Lenor has died off screen, which is just terrible. Cause why, why would you not, why would you rob me of the emotional impact of his death? Um, I'm still, I'm still upset that Alan is not Lenor in disguise. I'm still upset with that. Would it have been stupid? Yeah, but so was Rhaenyra breaking into the set on uh, King's Landing and smuggle back in there. So if we're going to have a Scooby, stupid Scooby-Doo hijinks, uh, plan can it not be Alan in disguise or sorry Lenor in disguise and nobody recognizing him also Rhaenys knew that Corlys cheated on her and had two kids when her own children have all died as far as she knows that that just hurts me I I was getting I was what was getting me by with her death was the fact that she didn't know that her husband cheated on her and yet and yet you do this to me that's irrelevant to the conversation but still um, I'm liking Masaria more or less in uh, this season. It does work out well because in the books I was a little bit... <sighs> Rhaenyra's very hung up on uh, Damon possibly cheating on her. She's not trusting everybody, yet she has Damon's former mistress so, so close to her. How did this work? I don't know why she would have hers, the Master of Whispers. But you know what? Fine. Sure, why not? Um, yet, uh, in the series, it works very well. They bond it together. Um, Miss Arya trusts her as well as she's, uh, telling about how her father had abused her and cut her open, left her for dead, and now can no longer have children, which leads me back to season one, where Damon had lied about her being pregnant, and that just could only hurt her more because she knew it was never a possibility. So, love that. I love, uh, her so far this season. No complaints there. Uh, Oscar Tully. Oh, delight. Beautiful. Uh, Lord of the Paramounts, Riverlands. Yeah, Liege Lord. His uncle has died. Damon thinks he can get a head, get some over on him. Um, now there was definitely a 
silent conversation where they knew how things would go. People were not going to just bend over for Damon because he's been a monster this time. They don't respect him. So they had to learn to respect Oscar Tully very quickly. So for the best way for that to happen, for them to get his respect, uh, would be for Oscar Tully to put Damon in his place. And I think Damon and him both knew this to an extent, but Damon did not know how far he would go. So, uh, for him to demand that, okay, I respect my uh, Queen Rhaenyra. We have sworn to her and the Rivermen, we keep our word. But as much as we hate uh, her consort here, he has also done some terrible things and we must put the Queen's justice into play. So for him to order the execution of uh, William Blackwood... Oh, and for Damon to do it. And it was because his actions, uh, the Blackwood's actions, by his orders, he was just doing what Damon said the entire time. The war crimes that were committed were on our King Consort's orders. I, I like Prince Consort better. I don't like King Consort, but whatever. Uh, and Damon takes his head anyway, and he's like, can't believe this. He's facing the consequences of his own actions. And it's such, it's so good. That moment is so good. Uh, then you have Ulf the White and Hugh the Hammer. I was not expecting to like these two. Oh my god. Oh. I'm gonna keep the spoilers for later seasons out of my mouth right now. They have claimed my favorite dragons, okay? I love King Jaehaerys, Queen Alicent, and their um, uh, dragons, Vermithor and Silverwing, are two of my favorite dragons, mostly because I love them. But uh, when um, Hugh the Hammer got Vermithor, those scenes of everyone just burning, of uh, the dragon Vermithor slaughtering everybody he deems unworthy, and for Hugh to come up to him and just scream at him, only to be accepted delight. And then Ulf running through the dragon caves, crashing into an egg sack, and Silverwing just popping up. It's like, oh, who's here? We have someone? We have visitors? Oh, you just met my husband? That's okay. Why are you screaming? And then for her to take him as her rider. Oh god, I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, but you, they put really a lot of work into, um, you Hammer's guy's um, backstory with his wife and daughter. His daughter has died. He had just asked Aegon for money to feed his families while they're starving to death because uh, of the blockade. And Aegon not giving them the, the money that he had promised. His daughter dying. Him being unable to protect his family. His wife wanting to run over to the town next to Bitterbridge Place. Uh, Trumbleton. I, oh my god. And him saying, I could be a dragon lord. Because he is the daughter, uh, the son of Sarah. One of my favorite Targaryens. I, I am so happy with his character. And it is going to crush me next season. I, I'm so excited. I am so excited. I'm also convinced that uh, Silverwing only took that elf guy because um, she had smelt Vermithor on him. Uh, and it's just like, you know my husband. You got past him. I'll take you. That's fine. That's my, that's my excuse. That's my excuse. So, like, there's a couple high highs. There are moments I absolutely loved. But then there's so many moments that I'm just like, why would you do this? Why would you make this change? Why would you take the agency from these characters? Why are they not the ones making the decisions? Are you really trying to push the narrative that the women in this world have no agency whatsoever and they're all taken away? Because that can only be entertaining for so long. Even Rhaenyra, she is the queen and her entire council is working against her the majority of the time. Um, oh, there is, oh, one more thing I forgot to mention. Uh, Jace. Absolute delight. I love the addition of him uh, calling it Rhaenyra saying like, you took uh, Sir Harwin Strong to bed. Did you think I would look like him? And at first I'm like questioning, why does he care so much? He is her heir. Um, does he really hate common born people so much that he doesn't want to be associated with a bastard name is what's going on. But then he's like, you are giving these people, these dragon seeds, dr uh, dragons for themselves. The only thing that made me special, that made me like the legitimate heir was the fact that I had 
a dragon. Even if he was a bastard, he has a dragon of his own because he is a Targaryen prince. But now you're showing that anyone can just ride a dragon. You're hurting my claim to the throne. I That's just a good addition that I really did love the show for making. So again, so many moments that work so well. Yet the series as a whole was dragged down by Harrenhal choices um, and the lack of agency for characters. It's like the story is happening around them rather than them making decisions that are driving the narrative forward, which could work in the sense of everything has now gotten out of their control. They may have started this war through a single decision and now everything is snowballing and piling against them and is they're reacting to the events as they're playing out. But that is just not an entertaining story that I enjoy watching. I like characters who are driving the narrative forward, not characters who are reacting to the narrative as it acts on them. So that's what I got so far. Final episode is in a couple of nights. So I will check in from a different location for how I feel about that. All right, Jessica coming from a different location now. I finished the uh, season finale. I don't know why I swept it. It was fine. There was nothing big dramatic about it. It was a fine send off for what feels like a filler season. Um, a couple more positives before I get more into it. I got nothing negative about this episode, just nothing overly positive either. Um, but about the season as a whole, I definitely like the focus on motherhood between Rhaenyra and Allison's, uh, how they interact with their children, how their children respect them, the relationship dynamics between them. That was all well handled. Aegon is somehow still my favorite character, and this uh, episode made that all the more apparent because Aegon, the one who did not see the value in the books and the wisdom of his father, who wanted immediate immediate gratification for everything that he was doing, who wanted that praise, uh, is laying broken in bed when he's offered the opportunity to run. He doesn't see the point, and he, they start saying, uh, look, um, Clubfoot Buddy is just saying all these different titles that he had been saying throughout the season. He wants to be known as Aegon the Just, Aegon the Conqueror, Aegon the Worthy, Aegon the Brave, whatever. And now he's decided he wants to be Aegon the Realm's Delight. He wants the love that his sister had before him. Something that he has not earned or anything like that. And that just adds so much to his character. I love that single line. Um, I also didn't mention about how um, Hugh Hammer guy, uh, he is riding his grandfather's dragon. Did I mention that already? Because I adore that. Like, I had people saying, like, oh, Jaharis will be rolling in his grave to know that his dragon is being ridden by um, the daughter that he sort of, yeah, he cast, cast her aside. He stopped her from running off with the dragon. He threw her into a nunnery and she broke out. I think she killed her sister or a sister. I don't know if it was her sister. Um, I... I still say, yes, he might be rolling in his grave a little bit, but at the end, he regretted how he treated his children, specifically how hard he was on his daughters. And for her to be like one of his last living children, if not his last living child, and just calling her out at the end, mistaking Allison for her, I, I think he would be proud to know that he did not do right by his daughter especially in his wife's eyes. Um, and now his dragon is protecting his grandson. I think that's sweet. I think he would approve. I'm probably wrong. Jaharis was a little bit of a hypocrite, but I do love him. Uh, the Lannister buddy is currently in contact with the triad to get deals done, beat up one in a mud fight, and it's just fine. But they're talking about possibly trading the step zones for their loyalty. And that possibly raising taxes and the cost of goods will go up. I swear to God, if they get the uh, step zones and that's why goods have to be raised, the taxes have to go up in King's Lang to pay for this, and they blame Rhaenyra for it. And, oh, I'm not... Why are we deifying Rhaenyra? We're starting to get her go a little crazy and making tough decisions in terms of attacking innocents, burning people alive, the dangers, the fall. She's going to see herself as this holy figure, and she's going to get lost into madness. But they started with her at such a high point, the saint of character could do no wrong. I just want her to be responsible for some bad stuff, make some bad decisions for good reasons in her mind, and it just, just let her be a very gray character. Back to Aegon, he was like, my dragon is dead. Is, is his dragon dead because... Does he just think that Sunfire's dead? I don't... What? Also, Helena apparently doesn't like riding dragons in this world. I, what the hell? 
I mean, like, that was her greatest joy. How she doesn't like... Why would she bond with a dragon if she doesn't like riding? I, if she got no taste for it. I don't understand that. We are completely in a completely different universe. Uh, other things I liked. I liked Alicent calling out Amon uh, for saying he burnt this town down because he felt insulted. And he's this prince region and he wants the love and respect, but he wants to conquer and rule, rule the seven kingdoms. But he's an insignificant little child throwing a temper tantrum and he's not worthy. So love that. And it really calls back on what the woman he had been sleeping with had been telling him. And he's probably hearing her voice in his head now um, saying that when princes lose their temper, it's the common folk who suffer. So maybe he'll have a change in attitude. I doubt it. I completely want Ulf to be poisoned at the dinner table. Like that, that man, he does not deserve Silverwing at all. And I'm so happy that we finally get the conclusion of Damon's character. He's been wishy-washy back and forth. Is he loyal to Rhaenyra? Is he not? Is he loyal to Rhaenyra? Is he not? But now he has seen the three-eyed raven. He's seen the threat to come beyond the wall, the White Walkers. The prince who was promised, which apparently in this version of reality is Daenerys. I personally believe it's Daenerys in all versions of the series, uh, but I guess there is an argument for Jon. I also love the theory that um, all dragon dreams have been leading to Daenerys. They are all about her, and they've just been interpreted in different ways, but they're all meant to lead to her, and I love that theory, so I love him seeing her. Um... And him recognizing that there is a greater threat to come. This war is only beginning and the realm needs to be held together. And Viserys had chosen Rhaenyra for that job. So he is completely loyal to her. His, him and his men all bow to her, declaring that they will fight for their queen. Love it. Danny is also, her hair is also fireproof in this version of the show as well. Just once let her be bald. Because I want, was it Aegon? No, different... Egg. I want Egg to think that he was Danny in the vision, okay? And she needs to be bald for that to happen. Uh, I love that Helena's dragon dreams are getting more specific so she can look at Amon in the eye and be like, you're going to die in the god's eye, swallowed by the sea, never to be seen again, and none shall mourn you. I love that. I love that. I love that for her. And he's just like, I, I could have you killed for this. And she's like, it changes nothing. Delight. Love Helena. Best part of the show. But now it's Allison's turn to do some Scooby-Doo hijinks to break into Rhaenyra's castle this time to have a conversation. The entire time, um, Rhaenyra's going, why are you here? Are you here for absolution? To uh, be redeemed for what everything you've done and everything you've set in motion? This is all your fault, you hypocrite. And she's like, I don't know. She's biting on her thumb. She's regretting back to that nervous tick of childhood, which I did like. But like, why? 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 Why come here? Why? She just wants to run away from all her problems and just forget this ever happened. But Rhaenyra is just like, no, I need to kill Aegon. You understand that? And she gives her child up. Thankfully, he's gone. Not thankfully, he should die. He's on the runs, but doesn't. They no one else knows that. And she's agreed that if they attack the city in three days, they will lay down their arms. There'll be no bloodshed. It'll be a as peaceful as can be, uh, turning of the reins of who will take over the throne. It's not going to go well when Aegon isn't there and Rhaenyra feels betrayed. Um, I'm also feeling really bad for Alison right now because all she wants, she says, is to walk free, unrecognized, with the open air, breathing free air, whatever. And I'm like, it's a good thing you're in an alternate universe because um, that's not going to play it very well if we go anywhere near what happens in the books. So... I have no complaints for this last episode, but the series as a whole, I'll give it a five, five out of 10, 5.5 5 out of 10. Okay. I'm, I'm mildly happy with it. It just really feels like a filler season to me. And that is really disappointing for a series I love so much. But next season, I have faith will be better because we got all the filler stuff out of the way. I hope. Please. So that's all I got. I kind of got to be quiet right now. I'm hiding in a basement, but talk to you later. Uh, let me know what you think of this season. I really do hope if you've been, been enjoying it that you continue to enjoy it. And I realize a lot of my issues are nitpicky details, changes from the book. I just feel it would have been done better, handled a different way, a different focus. But that isn't to say that the story that they're telling isn't for somebody. It's just not for me. All right. Talk to you later.